so I was uh, surfing the, the Twitter universe. The Twitterverse? Is that how you say it? Is that what the kids say? And um, You can be one of the kids, Doug. <laughs> According to the Muslim, according to the nice Muslim guy I talked to yesterday, uh, you're not old until you get into your fifties. So I am a young man. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so Travis Berry had a great comment. I loved it. Um, he said that every atheist commits the naturalistic fallacy because there are only descriptions, and one can't get a prescription from description. And I agree with that. Uh, do you agree with that? That you can't get a prescription yeah. from a description? Generally, I, I think it's it's very challenging to connect those two dots. Yes, very challenging. Uh, so even though I agreed with him, me thinking ahead, I, I think I know what he means by that, why he posted it, uh, showing inconsistency in worldviews. But the problem I see is that the is ought problem, the prescription from description problem, stills within his worldview. And so I asked him, um, well, first I wanted to clarify and I asked him, is the Hume's is ought problem that God commands it, thus it ought to be done? So I'm basically asking him, are, are you saying that you can, you can get an is from, or no, an ought from an is because God commands it? And he said, no which didn't really shock me because I knew that I didn't put the word God's nature or the phrase God nature in it. And that's why he said no. So then I changed it and I said, is the Christian's answer to Hume's is ought problem that we ought to do whatever reflect your God's nature? And then he responded, yes. Uh, and then some, he is an absolute personality. Thus he commands that which reflects his nature, which is a prescription. So then I asked him back, why ought I follow your God's commands, which reflect his nature? So I'm trying to show him that you still can't get an ought from an is just because God says it. Why ought I do it? Yeah, this is this is a point often lost on theists, it seems. It, they don't quite seem to to, to realize that with with all their protestation around subjective um the subjectivity of morality um that they kind of argue against themselves by doing so so the way he responded to that was to quote psalm 1830 which talks about um god being truth and god being the protector which the protector part, I think he's getting closer to my worldview. Like if he, he's saying you ought to follow God's commands because you'll be protected, I can sort of buy into that if it was true. Uh, because it's, it's more goals oriented now, right? It's you have a goal, your goal is protection. So if you do this, you will be protected. But instead of going that route, I basically said, um, why ought I care about your God's promises or protection? Maybe I don't want protection from your God. Uh, maybe I don't want, maybe I don't care about your God's promises. So again, you still have this problem. Why, how do I get a, an ought from this is that God is a promise keeper. God is a protector. And he basically said, read that verse again and have a good night. <laughs> And then I uh, assured him that I do agree with his first statement that you can't get a, a prescription from a description. And I'm hoping that he realizes that that's what he's doing. He's he's getting a prescription from a description, and the description is this all-powerful creator God who commands things. And a command is a prescription, right? However, you still have the problem of how do you get to why I ought to obey the, these commands. Yeah, and the, the difficult thing is um, they, they appeal to God's nature and that's all um, that's all well and good. But, but if they think it's fair to do so, then my question would be, why isn't it fair for us to do so as well? 
So if, for example, it is the case that pretty much every human being on the planet, um, at least the vast, vast majority of them, don't value suffering pain, that is, they, in fact, value it in the opposite direction. And that's like a tr the true state of affairs, and it's our nature that we effectively don't value pain or don't like pain. Um, why isn't it that from, if they think it's okay to derive an effectively an ought from a nature, why is it not okay for us to derive an ought from a nature too? Yeah. And, and again, this is whenever I am talking to a presup, I imagine how they will answer the exact same question they ask of me. And all I have to do is change a few words and, and give that same answer back to them. And that's exactly what you just did. Uh, so I think what it comes down to for them is, well, Doug, if you don't derive an ought from God's is's, God's commandments, you'll suffer eternity in hell. So that's a pretty good reason, isn't it, Doug? You don't, do you want to suffer eternity in hell? And um, so I think... Yeah, well, but I'll, you can see you can see how that doesn't work. It's like, you know, just to once again repeat the same game, but using our own technique. Like we could just simply go, well, you know, behaving in certain immoral ways is not in your best interest because it makes friction in society. Um, it makes it difficult for you to function and um, maintain a job. You might end up in jail. You don't really want to be in jail. It might have bad effects on your children and you really love your children. Like, you know, those are all things too. Like those are all consequences of actions. Like, mm -hmm. it, like, are you just saying that, um, that you're okay with the way that my morality is derived? <laughs> yeah. It, but again, they could say, well, that's just temporary pain and suffering. Whereas, you know, you atheists will suffer oh, eternal suffering. So it's not the, it's, it's not the, um, it's, it's the quantity, not the quality. Well, both, uh, they would say that the, the hell that their God has concocted is far worse suffering and longer than anything we would experience here on earth. That's why you ought to obey this this God. But even if it's true, everything they they say, how sad is it that that this is the reason why they ought to worship their God? Really, it's because of this huge threat of pain and suffering. Hmm. That's a hard pill to swallow, I think, even for Christians to hear. If that's the real ultimate answer to the isot problem. Yeah, I, is it a hard, I mean, it certainly would be for a lot, but, uh, but I have run into a fair few theists who don't seem to, I mean, I, I don't know exactly what it is, whether or not it's a failure of imagination, um, or if it's a, you know, personal lack of empathy or something, but they don't seem to see hell in the same gross way that i do yeah i well i think the whole idea of justice is uh, people like it uh, they like seeing or thinking at least that okay we have um, child molesters running around on this planet and they might get away with it all their lives but just you wait when they die they'll get what's coming to them and this is appealing to many people. Um, so I can see how some people kind of cling on to that concept of hell. But what I think a lot of Armenian Christians, the Calvinists not so much, but a lot of Armenian Christians would say, would have to admit that you could be a child molester uh, who dies at the age of 80, but for 79 of those, or let's say the vast majority of those years, molested children, but on his deathbed gave his life to Christ and now this child molester is now in heaven. So what kind of justice is that? Well, I mean, to be fair, uh, the Calvinists have to deal with that problem as well, is that they just seem to think that they have a better judgment 
over which people God actually elected versus which people didn't. Because I think in their view, there's nothing saying that a person must be elected at a specific time in their life, right? Right. So like it's at least consistent with their view that somebody could genuinely um, be like regenerated by God on their deathbed. So how do you answer the question, the is ought dilemma? Mostly actually the way that I described and, you know, I, I gave the theist a little bit of a prod <laughs> to sort of demonstrate how what I'm doing is no less, um, no, no less valid than what they are doing, but it's effectively an acknowledgement of the fact that biologically and structurally like the way that we are as humans we have a lot of com commonality among us um, and a lot of shared values in particular what we are okay with other people doing to us and our body um, a dislike for pain a a like for um for feelings of contentment and a likes for feelings of um like you know some kind of i guess like like harmony with each other um and fellow human beings and i think that like you know that might sound like a very vague description but there are a lot of components to it and so it's a very difficult thing to quickly summarize but the main point is is that there are aspects about ourselves that mean that there are is's in the world such as the way we're constituted um what typically happens in terms of cause and effects in the way that we behave to the consequences that they have um and my version of the ought that comes out of it it's not a logical ought which satisfies the is or problem but it's the type of ought that i'm comfortable with and i think it's meaningful enough okay. for morality i'm going to play the role of the theist right now because you mentioned consequences that you can get some is's because we can let's say with a high degree of probability because of cause and effect of the past see what certain actions will end up happening, would end up doing to ourselves. What if the theist was to say to you, you ought to obey God's commands because he can see all foreseeable consequences. He's omniscient. And he can relay this information to you in some way. Maybe it's not a perfect way, but he can help you navigate some of these consequences. And that is why you ought to listen to him. So I would say that I think that that's true. Like if all the all, all the parts of the that story were true, I mean, depending on <laughs> yeah. on what the god was actually like, of course, because maybe the god is like looking at all the consequences that would occur on the basis of action and is actually encouraging me to do something that I think is horrible <laughs> um you know and they just simply have different values to me the god does that is but um but yeah back to um yeah it would i it, what i would add like let's say if i'm playing the role of, of a travis berry i i love that answer uh but i would add is there any evidence that that's actually happening that the oh yeah that the, the theists are actually living better lives and navigating through the world in a way that they are having less negative consequences put upon them. Well, yeah, but I mean, they could easily appeal to um, consequences not obvious to our eyes because the the concern of God is not actions that produce positive consequences for you in your life on earth, but maybe instead positive consequences in the hereafter. Now, yeah, that, the, what you led on to say about the, you know, the evidence in terms of um, positive consequences for theists, I would also say, you know, what is the evidence that this God you know, that justifies the story in the first place. Like, it's all well and good to erect 
the story that like you know there is this oracle out there that gives us great information and tells us perfect things about how we should live our lives but you know unless i give you a good reason to believe that oracle exists anybody can invent a story like that it doesn't need to be the christian theist it could be the muslim theist it could be the um it could be the the hindu or it could be the the buddhist i mean it doesn't really matter what um and it could also be like some abstract idea about a programmer that created this world as like a simulation and is actually feeding through little bits of information to tell us how to live our lives like, i mean it's just like you know have i given you a reason to believe that doug no i haven't so should i should you take me seriously no you shouldn't 